there. It is June 26th, and it is time for some story time. And I'm kind of excited that I just saw that somebody got one of Jane Shaberg's books after I mentioned it the other day. That makes me so happy. Um, uh, she also, just since since I saw that, I'll just say she also did a book, um, Mary Mag, The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene, which is not, you know, which is a different Mary, of course, right? The legitimacy of Jesus is about Mary's, Jesus' mother. And then we have Mary Magdalene, that whole interesting story. So she has a kind of a, not quite a crossover. It's not quite for general audience, but it's not as super dense as some scholarship. But then there's also kind of a Cliff's Notes or Sparks Notes or whatever the that version, whatever the core corresponding is today, um, Mary, Mary Magdalene mis, misunderstood. Mary Magdalene understood. Isn't that funny? Anyway, there's like a reduced version of it, but this, the history and the misunderstanding about Mary Magdalene is also very interesting to me. And we will get to that at some point because I have decided to continue this little experiment. So uh, for the rest of the month of June, I'm going to go every day at three o'clock and then starting in July, I'm going to do Tuesday, Thursday instead of every day, partly because that way I can actually do it for a long time instead of, <laughs> uh, and if you're curious why just Tuesday and Thursday, it's because weekends people are doing fun things. Uh, Monday is my day for podcasting. Friday, I've noticed that people are kind of getting ready for the weekend and I don't, I could do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I suppose, do three days in a row. Anyway, but so Tuesday, Thursday, it is for, at least for now. So anyway, so we'll get to, we'll get to them. We'll get to it all. Essentially. I'm not sure this could take me a couple years to get through everything, but I'm going to keep going for now. So that's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, that was in reference to Jane Shaberg's book, The Illegitimacy of Jesus. And then she has some other things that are of interest to a lot of people who are into these kinds of conversations, um, looking at the early history of how Mary Magdalene's story has was mishandled probably intentionally and, and why it is that people think that Mary Magdalene was a sex worker when she wasn't, right? There's nothing in any text that says, suggests that she was. But the reason people think that is because of a um, kind of a combination of stories. So anyway, today is, okay, so here's what happened. So I started doing Matthew because of a question last week, and it was a great, I, I was kind of happy to jump into the Newer Testament for a bit. I started reading through the rest of Matthew last night to see what I should cover next. And then I realized, you know, it is kind of interesting that when it comes to the Gospel of Matthew, um, Jesus is not reported doing much talking about relation, the relationship we call marriage, which is not a huge surprise. I say, I think, you know, given he's out there trying to heal people and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, like he's not really talking about relationships. I think it's fair to say that it's not a huge surprise, but at the same time, it's a little bit surprising, you know, because then that means that most of the gospels are actually not going to be talking about this thing called marriage for us, which for people for whom these stories are important, I think that's noteworthy, right? So the, the chapters that touch on New Testament content. There are two in particular. There's one that talks about, that's called um, Newer Testament References. And then there's another one. Well, there's one on, there are two. There's one in Matthew 19, which is what I talked about yesterday. And Jesus's comments on divorce and adultery. So there's that. And that's about it. Like that's, that's really kind of all that Jesus talks about when it comes to marriage. Uh, so in the chapter on Newer Testament References, there's not a lot more to talk about. We do talk about some of the things in the Pauline letters, but when it comes to the guy for whom Christians, you know, the ultimate mo role model, the ultimate spokesperson, right? I mean, this is why people can have these posters that say what Jesus, you know, Jesus comment commentary on homosexuality. And it's like blank because there's nothing. There's also, you could also hold up a poster that says Jesus positive comments on marriage and it will also be blank. <laughs> And that, I think, is even funnier than the first, right? Like, he doesn't say anything positive anywhere in the Gospels about marriage. Jesus! Like, that is stunning, right? Um, he does say you can leave your family. We'll get to that. But, like, that's, so that's t tomorrow. Um, so as I was working through Matthew, Matthew chapter 14 has the story about the beheading of John the Baptist. And that does involve sex. So I 
thought um, I would look, we would read the slightly more interesting version, which comes from Mark. And again, if you're interested in these kinds of things, perhaps the scholarly or the kind of curious part of you is saying, oh, that's interesting. The earlier version is the longer one. So there was something problematic in it that they toned down or pared back or edited something in the second version, in the version that came along in Matthew. That is if you buy into what I do, which is I do think of Mark as coming first and Matthew and Luke came after. A lot of people want to make a big deal about which order they came in, understandable on a certain level. At the end of the day, I don't really care because I care about what they are and how they've, you know, how they help us or what people do with it. Um, but I do understand the interest of well, which came first, because that tells us something about the development of the of the early movement. So I, I get that. But it's not the thing I'm gonna like worry about at, in the middle of the night. You know what I'm saying? So so we're talking about so we only have a couple more things to touch on from the book of Matthew. I just I mean, isn't that in and of itself interesting to you? There aren't a lot of stories. There aren't a lot of sayings. You know, the parables, there are a handful of parables where Jesus refers to like the reception afterwards, but he's not talking about the relationship we call marriage. I just think it's interesting, noteworthy, right? So um, what the guy Jesus is doing, is attributed with saying and t about the relationship called marriage. It's never, he never says anything positive, affirmative about marriage. In fact, he affirms women, he affirms men uh, becoming eunuchs, which we looked at, which is counter to the whole be fruitful and multiply ideal of the first biblical passage that people use. Um, really fascinating, right? For, you know, I do realize that many people who are watching these videos really don't care about what the Bible actually says, but there are some people who do. And and I'm trying to be a per, I'm trying to be a scholar for a range of perspectives. You know, if the scripture, if these bio, if the Bible and these scriptures are still important to you, I think it should matter that Jesus says nothing positive about about marriage. I think it should matter that he does say you can leave your marriage to follow him. I think that should matter that he tells men, if you can handle it, chop your balls off. Like, I think that should matter. And if we're going to have the Bible as a touchstone for conversations today about marriage, then Jesus's comments, it seems to me, ought to be foremost in that conversation, not something from Leviticus 18 or 20. I mean, Right. I mean, his he's he's in the midst of it all uh, talking to people about this stuff. Right. Jesus also does not denounce Leverett marriage. In fact, he is approached about it and he doesn't say that's a really old fashioned thing. We should probably do away with that practice. No, he just rolls with it and talks, you know, and he just doesn't even almost like it doesn't even bother him. Jesus affirms the practice of Leverett marriage. Right. Like these things matter to me, you know, and I think they should matter to people for whom the Bible is sacred. I think we should be honest about it. And that is why I wrote a book on it, <laughs> you know, and I really did try to make it uh, as accessible as possible for a non-scholarly audience. Um, you know, the introduction is available actually on my website. You could read it to see why I wrote it, where I'm coming from, and see an overview of the of the book if you're interested. Um, so that's available for free. It's a PDF on my website. I will link that in the description after I wrap up here. Um, my website is my full name, jennifergracebird.com. So yeah, I think these are important, very, very important conversations to be having. So, okay, enough of the preliminary stuff. I'm going to read from Mark chapter six. And I'm going to read that version of the beheading of John the Baptist. And let me just see if I've um, if I've forgotten something. I'm excited. Um, so and so is excited about the book. That's I'm so that makes me really happy. Um, so all these things, good things, good things happening. Okay. Yeah, that's see KC. KAC, that's exactly my thought, right? If you're going to live by this collection of scriptures, then you ought to, I think it's important to be honest about what they really say. So, okay, Mark chapter six. And what is worth noting, but is not pertinent to the 
the filter I'm using, which is looking for stories that have to do with sex, the relationship we call marriage, and some form of physical abuse that involves intimate body parts. So this doesn't pertain to that. But when you get to the, the story, if there's a reference to the John the Baptist being beheaded, it is in close contact with the story about Jesus having authority to teach. And I referenced this kind of playfully the other day in one of the one of the live streams that if that it, it is also a thing that I think that most of most Christians do not take seriously, which is that John the Baptist wasn't just the guy who baptized Jesus in the Jordan, according to the tradition, but he was, you know, people like to talk about how he was a little bit because he lived out in the desert, you know, and when you're alone and living a solitary life, that will do something to you after a while. But also, you know, eating locusts and honey and living in the fort in a desert or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But he had a really intense message. And Jesus isn't just, I, I would suggest, and I learned this from other scholars, right, that Jesus isn't just being baptized by him, but he stands for the same things as John the Baptist. He's, it's like it's a, we're part of the same movement. This is a similar, not stump speech so much, but a similar motif or something, right? The intensity that you can see attributed to John the Baptist, I think could and should be used to understand Jesus. When I, when I hear people talk about Jesus in very kind and loving and almost sweet kinds of ways. I don't find that personally to be as honest because I see this almost hellfire and brimstone, not quite, but almost kind of an anger for justice and for people who are not behaving appropriately. And so I see a guy who's out there, you know, stirring the waters, making a fuss. I don't see somebody who's just all sweet and sitting down to you know, make friendship bracelets with you, but that's just me. Okay. So we have the, and, and I say all that because the opening part of chapter six of, of Mark is talking about where, where did this guy Jesus come from? Right. And so I'm going to start a little bit before the beheading, just to lead into it with some good content here. So I'm going to start in verse six. Um, so Jesus went about among the villages teaching he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony to them. It's interesting because this, I I did a little quick little seg segment on the references to Sodom and Gomorrah in the Gospel of Matthew, because in Matthew, it seems pretty clear that whoever's writing these down saw Sodom and Gomorrah as unrighteous as unwelcoming as that was the that was the issue it had nothing to do with any form of sexuality and two different stories attributed to Jesus on that makes me pretty you know like I don't care what you do with it but I think it's noteworthy so I did a little segment on that but in Mark there's no reference to Sodom or Gomorrah but in Matthew's version of the same thing I just read they have this in, they include this other piece about you know it'll for the town that doesn't accept you, it'll be worse for them on the day of judgment than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah, that kind of thing. Anyway, so if they refuse you, um, shake your shake the dust off as a testament against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it. Dun, dun, dun. For Jesus' name had become known. Aha! Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in this guy, Jesus. But others said, no, 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 it's Elijah. Because he was a prophet from before who went virtually up into, not virtually, but, you know, like raised into the, whatever that's called, ascended. That's what it was. And others said, 
it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old, which is very much what Jesus sounds like, in my opinion. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. <laughs> so he's terrified of this guy, Jesus, if he is John reincarnated as an adult. Anyway, I've never understood that part. So let's keep going because now we get the story. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had taken her. Actually, I guess it is Mary in the Greek. They have a verb for marrying, but they still don't have nouns for husband and wife. Okay. For John had been telling, had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So, you know, that's a biblical law, right? That's back in Exodus and sorry, in Leviticus, it's not in Exodus, it's in Leviticus, you know, talking about the marriage laws, right? You don't get to, well, you don't get to have sex with your brother's woman. Now, whether your brother is dead and you get to marry her, you know, like there's all these questions, but that's what they're referring to. That's the law they're referring to. And Herodias had a grudge against him, John, and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected John. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. Had a great many, he just brought so many great thoughts to mind, right? Into to thinking about. And, and yet he liked to listen to him. Some people actually do like a good intellectual engagement. Imagine that. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. So everybody picturing a banquet with a whole bunch of powerful, important men sitting around the table, long table, all kinds of people, banquet, lots of food, lots of beverage, right? When his daughter came in, so we don't know, I mean, there's, there's confusion about the names of the women. Again, not a big surprise that people are not getting the names of women straight, but we're, <laughs> we're not clear about the names of the women. Anyway, I don't want to make a big deal of it right now. So when his daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. So I want to make sure everybody understands, right? This is a semi-drunk group of men with a single young female dancing for them. She's not doing a waltz. Okay. We're clear about that. When a young woman is asked to come in to dance for a bunch of drunk men, get out your ones and your fives, right? Okay. Or so I've heard. So she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. Because I am so turned on right now. You can get whatever you want from me. <laughs> turned on and drunk. That's a great combination for men in power. <laughs> oh, geez. Right? And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give you even up to half of my kingdom. Because, yeah. All right. I think you got the picture. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Do you think she even knew, you know, like, do you think she knew what was going on? I mean, she had to know that that's a disgusting thing to ask for. <laughs> you know, had she heard her mom and dad talking or her mom and formerly uncle and now stepdad talking? I don't know. Immediately. I want you to give me this. Okay. The king was deeply grieved. Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Of course he didn't. He had spoken, right, rashly because of what was going on in the body at that point in time, both due to alcohol and hormones, right? We've got things flooding and he just, blah, and now he's got to deliver. 
he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in, in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples, that is John's, heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So there are a couple things I want to comment on. So this is probably going to be a short one today. One is I hope if you're familiar with biblical passages, biblical stories, I hope you hear a parallel to Esther. So at the beginning of the story, Esther's story, the very, very opening, <clears throat> Vashti, the king, the queen, the woman, the wife married, the woman married to Ahasuerus is, um, Vashti refuses to do this, right? They've been partying for several days on end and there's a whole bunch of men drunk and the king says, bring her on in here, you know? So she's probably being asked to do, a, you know, a similar kind of a strip tease or whatever. And she refuses. So she is gotten rid of, at least she's not beheaded. She's gotten rid of for standing up to the king like that. And good for her, Vashti, right? Good for her. And that's why I had a friend in seminary who named her daughter Vashti, um, a woman with a spine. Um, and, and, you know, so there's a really interesting thing to me that there's a, it's a, it's a very, is that enough? Is that enough times for it to be a trope? that women refusing to dance or women dancing for men. I mean, she doesn't refuse, she does it. So she works the system. Um, you know, I don't want to make a bigger deal out of it than it is, but I, I do think there's something interesting about this, that the, um, when the young woman, I mean, it is interesting. It's, it's a little bit ick, right? He's asking his own daughter, like stepdaughter to come in and dance for them. Is anyone else really kind of like kind of a little uneasy, sick to your stomach about that thought that he thinks she's really hot and wants to wants her to come, you know, he's wants to show her off to all of his buddies. It's just really kind of gross, right? The, I'm, I'm talking about Herod and his stepdaughter at this point, his niece, who is also his stepdaughter. Um, and I, you know, this issue of the way that women get to have power, the way that women in biblical stories are allowed to have power or have to take advantage of their position in order to get stuff done. Right. So, you know, you could say that in the book of judges, we'll look at that too, but like in the book of judges, um, Yael takes advantage of the position of, knowing how to seduce a man in, in a literal sense as, as a way of the bigger picture here. Um, women being put in situations where they have to be cunning or clever, um, sneaky in some sort of way in order to have some sort of influence. Or one could say that the woman in this story is just kind of lousy and low, you know, and not, I shouldn't be concerned about her. Um, I'm not sure that I like that she wants to kill John the Baptist, but I'm also not sure that John the Baptist needs to be getting up in their business about who, <laughs> like, it's really interesting, right? And, and so what fascinates me is there's also a story in Judith, which is a, an apocryphal writing, meaning it's not in official Hebrew Bible or Newer Testament, but it was written between the two intertestamental times, right? And many, many Christians do read it as scripture, but Protestants tend not to. So I didn't grow up with it. Um, but the story of Judith ha is a, you know, it's about a woman essentially who saves the people. And part of what she does is she uses her position as a female and as an attractive female, and she works it, right? And she gets into, in, in close with the uh, the the captain or general of the the enemy, right? So that she can get into his space and cut his head off, right? So there's there if you look if you're interested in art history, I think it is a fascinating way to look at the the I think it's an interesting way to look at church history is through art history and to look at you know the paintings and the artworks that were 
being requested and we're being purchased, right? You're charging an artist with creating certain things. And that over the centuries, men have been fascinated by this story of women beheading men. And so in this story, whether it's the Matthew, Matthew or the Markin version, the focus is on the woman who is dancing or the fact that she asks for John's head on a platter. And you'll see artwork depicting this. What I would like us to focus on, especially in light of take your pick, the Me Too movement, um, <laughs> you, you know, the, the way that there is a form of reckoning happening, um, the fact that this has been going on for for centuries, millennia, however you want to look at it. It's not like it's just a recent thing that men in workspaces have taken advantage of their position of power. And it's usually the women who end up being punished for it. If she's, if he's been making a, you know, a pass at her, or if he's pressuring her and she's in a, she is in the position of less power. She has to go along with things. She's the one who gets fired, all those different types of things, right? The men in power get away with shit, right? And I just think it's really interesting that this story, you know, Herod is the bad guy, in my opinion, because he's, I don't, well, I don't want to say bad guy. I actually don't like that language. But I just think it's interesting that we have a story about a man who's making a really bad decision based, and he's enjoying his power, and he's drunk, and he's just, I can just see it, right? It's just all the things are running through his veins and he's just so excited and all the men are loving the way his half, his stepdaughter just danced and he promises too much. That to me is the message for people, not the smaller, less powerful people who are caught up in his issues, right? Those people are doing the best that they can or whatever, or maybe being manipulated by others in, in the whole system, but they're more like cogs and he's more like the one driving the chariot, you know? So I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. I think it's, you know, maybe I should have a, an art historian come on and talk, you know, come and do a conversation with an art historian about this role of, about this beheading of women, of men um, supposedly or allegedly in these stories at the hand of a woman, whether by her hand, as in Judith with Holofernes, or being ordered by a woman, you know, John the Baptist being beheaded. Because he was because he was saying their marriage wasn't legit, which is a really interesting thing, you know. Got it's gotta make you wonder if there's more going on there, right? Anyway, um, sex, marriage. I don't think there's any, well, I, I think you could say that Herod is, is doing a form of pimping out his stepdaughter, right? His niece and slash stepdaughter in asking her or requiring her to come dance. And maybe she enjoyed it. I don't, you know, I'm not there. There are people who really actually enjoy getting to dance for other people, um, you know, at whatever level of clothing. And some people very much enjoy it. Some people like being watched and some people, you know, all that, but, um, but it's also worth noting that there's a form of manipulation, coercion, use of his own power over her and her body. Um, and it just makes me, I still come back to the ick factor here, right? That he's even asked her to do that. Um, and everybody's just playing along and making it, making the most out of it for themselves. I'm going to look at, I do think this is fiction. I'm not trying to, or, you know, nitty. Is this a dig by the Greek writer to make Herod even more of a dick? Um, I mean, sure. Potentially. Yeah. Do you mean because of the dance scene itself? Um, or do you mean the beheading of John part, you know, getting rid of John? Um, I don't, it's so funny that you put it that way. I, I think that's very, very possible. I haven't thought that through. And I think that's very possible. I think that, um, I don't think that Herod needed help looking like an asshole. <laughs> I think he was already very much, um, 
using and abusing people, um, using his position of power to get what he wanted with lots of different people. And I think the Herods, there are several generations of Herods, and I don't think any of them actually are worth um, naming your child after, if you're tracking. Okay. The Antiquities doesn't have Salome for this execution reason. Well, and we need to be careful. Actually, I was trying to be be clear about Salome, right? Where does Salome actually come in to the picture? Because where do we get the name Salome to begin with? And I was, tr I was actually trying to find that last night, and I'm not sure where that actually comes in. Are you saying antiquities as in Josephus antiquities? The Salome is not a name that's used in the Matthew or the Mark version. And I didn't even go look in the other two, just to be honest. Is it is just in, in Josephus? Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting. Okay. Well, that's that's it for now. I I wanted to highlight something. I know they're not all as juicy and as and as exciting. Um, so this is more of a lull. I don't have as much to be worked up over, but I do think there's something really interesting and familiar. Maybe that's why I wanted to make sure to talk about this. There's something familiar here that the men in power are getting away with all kinds of stuff, and the women are the ones getting blamed for what's going down. But in this instance, this was really about Herod and John the Baptist and women are feeling, well, according to the story, again, I don't, I don't think this is necessarily historical, but according to the story, which does have reflections of true human interactions on some level, right? Um, according to the story, um, the women um, are feeling backed into a corner or are simply being used, I would say, his um, daughter, stepdaughter and niece, same person, um, probably didn't have any idea what she was doing when she walked into that banquet hall and did some dirty dancing, right? She probably had no clue what was happening inside those men's bodies as she did that. Unless she was old enough to know. I don't know how old she was. <laughs> All kinds of things. That's it for today. Um, I know that there are a couple more stories, at least in Matthew. So we'll, we'll get back to that tomorrow and next day. And thank you for showing up. Thanks for being here today. And, um, I hope there was something new, something maybe bringing together ideas you've had in a way you hadn't put them together, something new for you. Thanks for being here. Um, if you're watching on a replay, same, same for you. I hope there was something helpful and I will be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. Thanks.